actually is a rhetorical question I'm asking myself. And after that, we'll move into questions from, from Kinsey. The question I'm asking myself is this. Could you please discuss the full titles of your authored book, Our Voices, Oral History, Resistance in the World War II Japanese American Social Disaster, and your edited volume, Nisei Naysaya, the memoir of militant Japanese American journalist, Jimmy Omura. The title of the first book, Our Voices, was a play on words pertaining to those selected Japanese American groups and individuals during World War II resisted their community's confinement in barbed wire enclosed U.S. concentration camps. The first item in the subtitle, Oral History, refers to the historical method utilized by the author, me, to generate documented key evidence about the resistance mounted by Japanese Americans to their incarceration, not only inside their concentration camps, but also outside of them. The second item in the subtitle, Resistance, denotes a special type of activity defined by sociologist Roger Gottlieb in connection with Jewish resistance during the Holocaust and characterized by him as authentic resistance. In the words of Gottlieb, to qualify as authentic acts of resistance, their motivation must be to present, restrict, or terminate the oppressor group's exercise of power over the oppressed, not simply to transfer oppression from oneself to another of the oppressed group's members. In short, the goal of resistance must be to lessen the total quantity of oppression, not just to shift it around. Otherwise, one is not resisting, but simply trying to avoid personal suffering. In addition, Gottlieb argues that intention is indispensable to the concept of authentic resistance. What we need to know, he says, is not whether an oppressed group resisted effectively, but rather whether they sought to resist. Moreover, Gottlieb emphasizes that to obstruct the power of an oppressor, of an oppressor means to place oneself in jeopardy. The third item in the subtitle, Japanese American Social Disaster, describes a disaster that resulted not from a natural cause like an earthquake a hurricane or a tornado, but rather a dis disaster that was man-made, mass exclusion and incarceration of almost an entire ethnic population. Although definitions of disaster are characterized by imprecision, an inventory of them reveals agreement on the following salient elements. One, whole or part of a community must be affected. Two, a large segment of the community must be confronted with actual or potential danger. And three, there must be a loss of cherished values and material objects resulting in death or injury or destruction to property. Now, given these criteria, it's hardly an exaggeration or a distortion to say what the Japanese American population underwent, underwent during World War II qualifies as a disaster. First of all, the mass removal and confinement policy of the U.S. government directly affected almost the entire Japanese American mainland community. Not only healthy adults, pregnant mothers, hospitalized cases, the extremely aged, and even infants and orphans were evicted to makeshift and isolated detention centers. Second, from the time of Japan's attack on the Pearl Harbor Naval Base in Hawaii on December 7, 1941, to the ultimate closing of the 10 War Relocation Authority administered concentration camps, this affected majority of the Nikkei community dwelt in a daily atmosphere colored and confounded by actual and potential danger. If before the Japanese Americans' exclusion and confinement per se, it was difficult to distinguish between potential and actual danger, thereafter it became virtually impossible to do so. Who is to say? whether living in a horse stall or being surrounded by barbed wire and monitored by armed sentries and watchtowers posed a real or prospective danger to the imprisoned Nikkei. Lastly, there is no denying that the third criterion applying to disasters, a loss of cherished values and material objects resulting in death or injury or destruction of property 
fits the facts of what the confined uh, wartime Japanese Americans faced. Not only were entire West Coast Japanese American communities uprooted and scuttled by Executive Order 9066, but also the series of actions that this uh, action catalyzed entailed a cataclysmic change in every facet of the victimized population's cultural composition. The fabric of family was stretched and <coughs> torn, the patterns of leadership disturbed, the economic structure dismantled, and the underlying sense of personal family and community identity in danger. And infusing and imparting focus to the assorted socioeconomic losses was the psychological conviction of being a threatened people. But what about the title and the subtitle of the other book here under consideration, Nisei Naysei, the memoir of militant Japanese American journalist, Jimmy Omura. The first word of the title, Nisei, is simply the term applied to second generation Japanese Americans, the US citizen born children of the Issei, the immigrant generation of Japanese Americans who were barred by law until 1952 from becoming naturalized US citizens. These Nisei represented approximately two thirds of the 110 to 120,000 of the incarcerated Japanese American population during World War II. At the outset of the war, the average age of a Nisei was 17 and one half years old. As for James Matsumoto Jimmy Omura, a slightly older Nisei, he was born in 1912, which made him 30 years old at the war's outbreak. The second word of the title Nisei or denotes Jimmy Omura as being not only an above average age Nisei, but also one somewhat different in temperament from the norm of others of his generation, which the late journalistic historian Bill Hosokawa characterized in his 1969 book, Nisei, as the quiet Americans, who are also notable for their being compliant and cooperative. So then what is the definition of the word Nisei Nisei? According, or of the word Nisei. According to one dictionary I consulted, the word conjures up a string of similar words, doubter, gloomy, pessimist, downer, complainer, misanthrope, party pooper, defeatist, sourpuss, killjoy, prophet of doom, and wet blanket. <laughs> Another dictionary, however, gives this definition of naysayer, one who denies, refuses, opposes, or is skeptical or is cynical about something. This definition comes much closer to what I had in mind in labeling Jimmy O'Mora as a naysayer. Still, a third dictionary I perused provided me with four synonymous terms for naysayer that I found even more germane in depicting O'Mora. Dissident, nonconformist, protester, and resister. For this very reason, I elected to use the following passage drawn from Thomas Rick's 2017 book, Churchill and Orwell, Thomas E. Ricks' 2017 book, Churchill and Orwell, Orwell, The Fight for Freedom, as the epigraph. I use this quote as the epigraph for Nisei Naysayer. To refuse to run with the herd is generally harder than it looks. To break with the most powerful among that herd requires unusual depths of character and clarity of mind. But it's a path we should all strive for if we are to preserve the right to think, speak, and act independently, heeding the dictates, not of the state or fashionable thought, but of our own consciences. Similarly, I had words like dissident, nonconformist, protester, and resistor in mind when I advisedly launched my introduction to Nisei Naysayer with these words. James Matsumoto Omura, 1912-1994, was the foremost editorial voice raised against the US government's World War II exclusion and incarceration of Japanese Americans. He was also the chief spokesperson decrying the Japanese American Citizens League's, the JCL's, collaborative role in this shameful development. The lone Nikkei journalist to, editorially, uh, to editorialize against the JCL endorsed federal policy of drafting imprisoned Japanese American citizens into the military Omura was the first Nikkei to seek governmental redress and reparations for wartime violations of civil liberties and human rights. The heroic role he played in redeeming the tarnished repute and self-esteem 
of the Japanese American community has been greatly underrecognized and generally unheralded by Nikkei and non Nikkei Americans alike. Without question, James Omura deserves to be accorded a place of honor in U.S. history commensurate with that already consecrated for resistors Gordon Hirobayashi, Minoru Yasui, Fred Korematsu, and Mitsui Endo. As for militant, the one word in Nisei Naysayer's subtitle that here requires explanation, my use of it is consonant with the common dictionary definition of this adjective, to describe people who believe in something very strongly and are active in trying to bring about political or social change, often in extreme ways that other people find unacceptable. Militant was a word that Jimmy Omora both frequently and proudly applied to himself, and most especially in reference to his role as a journalist. Thank you, Art, for that very detailed response. Um, going into some questions now. Uh, although the theme of Japanese American resistance to oppression during World War II dominates both barbed wire, uh, bar, uh, barbed voices, and Nisei Naysayer, how would you compare and contrast the type of resistance highlighted within the two books? In barbed voices, uh, I think the dominant type of resistance, although both types of resistance are represented, uh, and I'll describe the second one uh, after this, the dominant form of resistance within uh, barbed voices uh, is direct action. Uh, and this direct action usually culminated in uh, physical violence. Uh, the beating of people who were construed by the community as being informers, uh, currying favor with the administration, et cetera, and, and, and sometimes extending beyond any kind of empirical evidence to, to uh, you know, to, in the course of, of, of trying to curry favor, to say uh, incorrect and mischievous and, 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 and sinful things about other people that got him in trouble. I have two case studies in Barb Voices. One of them deals with the Manzanar riot, which you've seen quite a bit about. And the other uh, case that I have in there uh, has not been discussed very much. But you know, in 19, uh, late 1942, beginning in mid-November, there are actually three major sort of resistor events. Uh, there was the posting strike, which occurred in, in the middle of November of, of 1942, and uh, the, the, the Omori film uh, you saw goes into that. Uh, and this was when one particular uh, uh, JACL-related leader, who was a rice grower from the Imperial Valley named Kei Nishimura, uh, was, was beaten up by several people, and the two people who were charged with it were both Judaists. One was George Fuji, and the other was Isamu uh, Uchida. And both of them came from Orange County, where I actually live most of the time. Mm -hmm. And we have interviews with, with George Fuji in the Japanese American Project at Cal State Fullerton. And uh, so uh, this was one case, and, and they were never able to prove that they were, in fact, involved in the beating. And they still haven't to this point. There's no, no conclusion to that. Now, the third uh, one was the Manzanar riot. And the person who was uh, allegedly charged with this was Harry Renner. And nobody up until recently was able to provide any proof. And I, I was the person that was able to provide, provide some proof. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. But in between these two events, at the Gila River Camp in Arizona, there was also a beating of a person who was not a JACL member per se, but his whole crowd was basically JACLers, and Gila was the only camp that had a JACL chapter in the camp. Uh, and, uh, and his name was Takio Tada. Tada. And, uh, and uh, Shoda Hirakane was one of uh, six or seven people who were alleged to have beaten him, but the only one who owned up to it was Hirakane. Hirakani was an Issei. He wasn't an, a Kive. He wasn't an Issei. He was an Issei. He had seven kids. He had a respected position in the camp, on, 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 on the camp council, but he readily admitted that he was the one that did it. He said that he was proud of doing it, 
and we felt that he did it for the good of the community because it was the only way to raise an awareness among the administration to all of the things that were wrong with the administration. And it was such a successful sort of thing that at a point in time that he was jailed for a month. And when he got out of jail, he came back and his cohorts in the camp so championed him that they threw a banquet for him, invited all of the administrative bigwigs to come and sit there, and they dared not uh, turn down the appointment. And there he served liquor, which was uh, unallowable. He called it Japanese tea. <laughs> and he served an elegant dinner, and he had all of the people dress up in their finery. And, and then they repeatedly re toasted uh, uh, Hirakani for his act. And, uh, and the, the, the anthropologist Rob, Robert Spencer, who was at the Gila River camp, said that at that point in time, the balance of power in the Japanese American community, of, of, of the whole community of the Gila River camp, was no longer with the administration of the WRA or the American government. It was the Japanese American community themselves. Now, it didn't last very long, because by the time that they had the, uh, in February, they, they had the, you know, the, the royalty registration and everything, and it was very much confronted by the people in Gila River as well as many other camps. But uh, at that particular time, the administration swooped down with the FBI, Naval Intelligence, Army Intelligence, local police force, and they just wiped out anybody that they thought was part and parcel of that. Now, as a result of that, when the draft resistance movement came along in 1944, only two camps did not have draft resistance. One of them was Gila, because most of the people that were against the camp were taken out, the troublemakers, so-called, and at Manzanar. After the, because you got to remember that the largest group of people who said no to the loyalty oath were at Tule Lake, so they made it into a segregation center. But the second largest number came from Manzanar. So they wiped out the big part of the resistance from the Manzanar thing. So both of those camps did not have any draft resistance movement in 1944. So, interesting. Um, thank you. you. You were very fortunate to be able to conduct oral history interviews with two very prominent World War II Nikkei resistors, Harry Weno and Jenny Omoda. Could you discuss your interviews with these two men in the context of assessing the overall value of oral history in historical representation and explanation? I published uh, a, a co-authored article with one of my graduate students, uh, David Hacker, in, in, in 1974 in the Amerasia Journal. It was the first thing that I'd ever written about Japanese Americans. Now, I wasn't a total rank rookie in this, in the sense that for a year and a half before that, uh, Dave Hacker and I went from Cal State Fullerton to UCLA to use the Manzanar papers that were there. and. All we did was on our 35-mile drive to UCLA and 35-mile back, and during our time where was to concern ourselves with the demands in our riot. I mean, I was dreaming about it at night. I knew all this information. The article was one of those things almost which wrote itself. And it's, it, it, it's, it, there's an article, that article appears in Bar, in Bar Voices. In any event, by the time that I had written that thing, I was unable to, to, uh, interviewed two people that I wanted to interview. I interviewed all other ty types of people involved with the riot. But I wasn't able to interview Harry Ueno, who was the principal figure in the Manzanar riot. And I wasn't able to, 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 to interview the person who he allegedly beat up, Fred Tayama, who was the super JACL leader within the camp. And uh, the reason I couldn't interview Tayama was because he was dead. You know. Uh, but as for Harry Ueno, I thought that he was dead or he was, had gone to Japan to live. As it turned out, so did the people I talked to. They thought one or the other. But then all of a sudden, Sue Embry, uh, who was one of the people I interviewed, Sue Kunitomi Embry, who had been an editor of the, the Manzanar Free Press during World War II, Sue, Sue Embry got in touch with me. She said, Don Hata, a professor at uh, Dominguez Hills, has has had a call from Harry Ueno in San Jose 
and Harry O. Eno wants to be interviewed. Don says, you know, I, I really don't know enough about the Manzanar situation to be able to interview him. Sue, would you be willing to do that? She said, I'll do it if I can do it with Art Hansen. So in 1976, 1976, we motor up to San Jose, and we do the interview with Harry. It was a very important interview with just his wife there and Sue and myself. And at one point in, in, in the interview, I asked him, Harry, do you know, or were you involved in the beating of Fred Kayama, or do you know who was involved in the beating of him? He said, there are some things you don't talk about. And, I, and he was kind of hemming and hawing, and I turned off the tape recorder, and I said to him, I said, Harry, you don't have to feel obliged to speak about this on tape, but I think at some point in the future, that you may discharge a debt to posterity by clarifying this mystery about what happened at Manzanar on the night of December 5th, 1942. Then we continued with the interview. Well, over the next few years, my wife taught at San Jose State. So I was up in the San Jose State uh, area around San Jose, and then Harry moved to S Sunnyvale where he's doing it. And I always went over to see Harry, and I, would, I wrote letters back and forth to him, and I never bugged him about, were you involved in the beating or anything? We just carried on. In fact, he spoiled me. Every time I went up there, and I, I was about 55 pounds bigger than I am now. <laughs> you know, I guess, guess the, the, the proper word to use is I was fat. <laughs> but anyway, Harry would always make me, because remember, he, he was as a cook at Manzanar. He would make me what he called an American lunch, and then he'd also make me a Japanese lunch. <laughs> but I was, I was even fatter when I left. Well, we carried on, and one time he wrote me a letter, and in the course of the letter, his, 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 his narrative segued off in a particular direction in which he seemed to be talking about what had happened on the night of, of you know, December 5th, 1942. So I wrote him back. I said, Harry, were you trying to tell me something? And then he wrote back, he said, it's been 40-some years, he said, I think I should fess up. And he said, I was involved in it. I masterminded the, the, the beating. And he said, and there were four other people, all Kibe, younger than me. Harry was in his mid-30s. They, they were in, from the late 20s down to, to the early 20s in age. So Harry said, and so I wrote him back and I said, Harry, I want to give you some, some choice on, on this confession that you're making. I, I said, you can either have this information released by our archives here at Cal State Fullerton immediately, or in 25 years, or in 50 years. Use your own judgment. What he answered back was immediately. That's when I used my own judgment. I didn't think that was a good time to reveal it. I thought it should take some time. There were things going on in the community at that time that a lot of people wanted to jump on the idea that all of the activity of dissenters and stuff were by wild-eyed Kibe radicals that were pro-Japan and stuff. And so I asked Sue Embry, who had done the interview with me, and Sue said, I don't think we should release this now. I asked a couple of other people, Barbara Shikei uh, and, and Martha uh, uh, Nakagawa, uh, who were privy to a lot of things about Harry and stuff like this, and they said, let's not do, release it right now. So we didn't. So when I finally released it, it was in this book. And, and so we have a couple of things in there. Uh, uh, Rain Hirabayashi, who was the editor of the series in which the book appears in, and I had a, a question about how that might have changed my attitude towards uh, Harry. And I said it didn't change my attitude toward Harry. I felt that, you know, we can countenance the idea of Quislings being beaten by people uh, who uh, were part of European countries that were taken over. In fact, we praise them as freedom fighters, as resistors, etc. cetera. And, and I don't necessarily, con you know, I, I don't truck with violence as such, but I can understand very well how people can be moved to violence as a last resort, which it was. There were so many things happening in the camp that stacked the deck against particularly the Issei and the Kibe. Not that uh, you know, uh, you know, the Kibe and the Issei didn't have allies among the Nisei population. They did, et cetera. But by and large, et cetera, most of the, the disadvantages 
or to the, 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 to the Japanese speaking. And I said, the, one of the disadvantages was that you couldn't, they had to conduct meetings in the English language. Well, the leaders of the community were the Issei, and most of them were far more proficient in Japanese, sometimes exclusively so. And the Kibei, many of whom had returned from Japan not too long ago, themselves were problematic when it came to speaking English. You still heard traces of it in Harry Ueno many years later. So, you know, uh, in any event, recently, I, I was talking to somebody at the Cal State Fullerton oral history program, and I said, you know, I was once up at, at Harry's, and it was after this 1994 thing, and I said, Martha, Naka wa Martha Nakagawa wanted me to interview Harry about uh, his experiences at the Loop Isolation Center because Martha's father was at Loop, and she's never been able to find out what was happening with him. So I started asking him that, and again, and maybe he was going into an early period of dementia. But he all of a sudden, again, segued real quickly and started talking about, about the meeting. And so, and I, I, but I didn't remember even tape recording it or getting an agreement form from him or anything. But then I asked the tape, said, oh, yeah, his, his interview's here. It's transcribed. You know, we, we've actually, you know, got it available and stuff. And so you'll see it in there if you want to get a hold of that interview. It's the, the address is available where you can, where you can get, get, get a hold of the interview. So anyway, that's the experience with, with Harry. Now, with, 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 I'll make this fast with Jimmy, because I know time is running short. Uh, I met Jimmy O'Moore in 1983 at a conference at, in Salt Lake City, Utah. We, we were both taking a bus from our hotels, a shuttle bus from our hotels in downtown Salt Lake out to the University of Utah campus. And this was a, a, a conference on, 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 on uh, you know, relocation and redress is what it was called. And uh, anyway, uh, when I was on the bus, there was a, a gentleman that got on after me, uh, an elderly gentleman, and he, I didn't know at the time it was James O'Mara, but then he had a badge, and he turned around to shake hands with me, and I said, I said, I said James O'Mara, I said, you're not by any chance the Jimmy O'Mara, are you? And he said the very same. And then I, I said, I thought you were dead. And he said, no, I'm very much alive. <laughs> so then at that conference, it was agreed that at a point in time, I would, uh, he would come to, uh, to Southern California, and I, I would set up an interview. Well, he did. He stayed at my house for five days. And he, interview, he was so ready for that interview. He'd already done a five-day interview with Frank Kim. He did five days more with me. And it was, we didn't have air conditioning in our house. And I, oh, he opened up one of his suitcases, and I noticed that the whole thing was full of medicine. Well, he, he was a, he was a, you know, not cardiac arrest yet, but he was damn close to it. And I thought, I'm going to kill this guy. All I wanted to do was to, to save his life for posterity mm -hmm. and to hear what he had to say. And every morning when I woke up, he was already downstairs sitting in the couch in the living room ready to be interviewed. Mm -hmm. So I stayed in touch with Jimmy. After that, and and when he was when he was writing his book, I sent him all kinds of documents, as so many other people did. Particularly Michi Weglin and Aiko Herzing, uh, Yoshinaga, both of them were, were saints. They sent all sorts of stuff and everything. And so, you know, when James O'Mora, uh, Michi Weglin said to me, "You know what? I'm afraid James James is going to die." And then this book is not going to. He said, "We need this book out. We need to not be seen as a community of wimps." We need to have voices that spoke out against all odds. And Jimmy was one of them. He's got to get this book finished. And so I promised Mitchie that I said, if, if, if Jimmy passes away, I'll finish it up. Well, he, he lasted long enough, basically, to get out a rough first draft of it. And what I took over, when I got named by the family to do it, that's what became this particular book. And with Frank Chin and with uh, you know Frank Ave, and with Yosh Koromiya, et cetera, we were able to cobble together this thing. And, and, and I think it's, it's a really important sort of book and something that you know, should be a point of pride to, to the Japanese-American community. Uh, so. On that note, uh, what practical outcomes would you like to see result with the combined publication of Bar Voices and Nisei Nisei? For more work on resistors and resistance movements. I think the door has been open for a long time. Uh, but I think we still need to, to, to bang away at it. We're long since uh, over the fact that people had to be ashamed to say that they were at Peter Lake segregation camps. Now it could be a point of pride. 
As Gideon Omar was a naysayer, a good portion of the Japanese American community were. Don't forget, the thing that got people there was saying no. It's the power of saying no. It's easy to say yes, it's easy to conciliate, it's easy to accommodate, it's a lot harder to be able to take issue, especially when there's overweening power arrayed against you. So one thing I'd like to do is to see more of that. When I went to Denver to speak, I told them, I said, you know, you got this holy shrine in Socorro Square in Denver. And you got the bust of different people, including Ming Yasu there, and Ralph you know, Carr, the governor of, of Colorado, because of the action he took on behalf of Japanese Americans. But I said, you need to put Ginny O'Mora's bust in the grave. He needs to be there. He lived from 1942 when he moved there to 1994 when he died there in Denver. He's a Denver hero. He should be recognized. The Denver community, the Japanese American community there, especially the JCL chapter, needs to apologize to James O'Mora. Another thing that needs to be done is that the national JCL needs to apologize to James O'Mora. They took somebody who was trying to do something good for the Japanese American community, and they made him their number one enemy. And they tried to railroad him into prison. The next thing is that I think the, the JCL needs to apologize to the Japanese American community as a whole. They were involved with accommodating the decision. When people of the JCL leadership, and I'm not indicting all the JCL, this is a very heterogeneous organization. There are a lot of people in it for a lot of different reasons. They're not all culpable in this. It's the leadership of the wartime group. And the JCL is now apparently undergoing a, you know, a rejuvenation and starting to think more broadly and everything and less in, you know, in circumspectly. And they maybe should take the lead in rendering an apology. <coughs> the US government, who was the main uh, opponent of the Japanese American community, of course apologized. That's what we have, the Civil Liberties Act of 1988. We need an apology from the Japanese American citizens here. The other thing, I think that James O'Mora, I think that James O'Mora should be considered for a Presidential Medal of Freedom. Uh, all three, uh, uh, the Minyasui and Gordon Hirabayashi and Fred uh, Hirabayashi have, have, have been given those posthumously. And I think that Mitsui en Endo is going, to, is going to be given one too. Mm -hmm. But I think that it's not only James O'Mora. We got to start rallying up, uh, you know, and it probably won't work in the Trump administration. <laughs> I mean, you know, oh, I'm not an impossibilist. <laughs> but there are a lot of other people, and, 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 and I've thought about it. Aiko Herze Yoshinaga, and I think that she would fly under any administration, frankly. I think Wayne Collins, for God's sakes, what he did. You know, uh, Yoshi Okamoto, Frank Emmy, uh, you know, Yuri Koshiyama, there are, uh, there are a, 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 a lot of people that deserve this consideration. You make up your own favorite list, et cetera, and mobilize support for them. You know, uh, when Carter, Jimmy Carter, was, was making uh, nominations, one of the people he gave a, uh, a Presidential Medal of Freedom to was John Wayne. <laughs> John Wayne. And one pundit who was particularly upset about this said, John Wayne, he's not even a good actor. <laughs> you know, he, he only plays heroic figures. He's not a hero. Well, the people that I'm speaking about, being, having their names put forth, are real heroes. People who took heroic actions, they're the people that should get a Presidential Medal of Freedom. Okay, thank you, Art. Um, at this time, I'd like to call the uh, Omoji sisters up here, please. And, and one, one last question. You make no bones about the ro ro role of the JCL and its complicity with prison camp authorities. What response have you had from members of the JCL to your work? I haven't had much of a response so far. I did speak at the Tule Lake Pilgrimage with the current president of the uh, thing, and he was willing to have myself and uh, Frank Abe and, and others who were, were speaking on a resistance panel at Tule Lake to, to, 
to have a program in which J the JCL would actually support it and it would be held at Ganem. And Ganem was another, I, you know, I've been employed by Ganem officially and then later on as a historical consultant. And Ganem has never had anything to, to, to show that, that James O'Moore was alive. Nothing. So they should have, as, as a chief museum for the Japanese American Community National Museum, they should definitely have some kind of substantive program about, about uh, substantive exhibit about uh, James O'Moore. Okay, um, can we give a, a round of applause for our <laughs>